connected. The amount of wide open space here is just incredible. And I love that, that aspect of just being so kind of free. Once you get right outside of Vegas, it's a whole new world out here. Henderson, Nevada, 15 miles southwest of Las Vegas. In early October, the nine crew members of the Nevada Backcountry Discovery Roots team assembled here to prepare for their trek. I went to work for Touratech about seven years ago and that was before our involvement with backcountry discovery routes, but uh, shortly after I started, uh, we went out and did some adventure riding. I had off-road experience and industry experience, but not really adventure bikes. So we went out and did uh, the Oregon BDR, which was a route that existed for many years, and uh, kind of got the bug, and then one thing led to another, and now we're on number seven. The backcountry discovery routes is a, is a lot of work, and we've got this team of volunteers that put in a ton of time and effort and their own money to make it all happen. But really what makes that all worthwhile is when you find someone at a trade show or you run across someone out riding and they learn about backcountry discovery routes and they are so excited about it. We, we have people, every trade show I go to, people come up and tell me they saw the YouTube videos, the next thing they know they were in a dealership buying a motorcycle and it really inspired people to get out and ride. And that is just, that's what it's all about for me is just hearing those stories, meeting people that it made a difference. You know, it got them to go out and do this form of recreation, which we just think is so much fun. It's such a great way to explore and to just check out from, from the normal life. And so that's really, for me, that's probably the, the biggest highlight is seeing it through the eyes of other people that have out, gone out and done the routes. Trailmaster Venture Gear uh, was a uh, product line that I started several years ago, actually probably seven, eight years ago, um, and it was just born out of a passion of adventure riding and a product that I saw that I needed. One thing that's really kind of cool about the BDRs or the Backcountry Discovery Routes is that um, we do find a lot of like-minded people who have, you know, they've been successful in whatever business they have and, and, and now they have some disposable income to uh, to be able to take the time and, and go do a route uh, whether they're with us or going and doing something on their own uh, but then you run into these people on the trail and it, you immediately you kind of have a uh, an immediate bond when you say, hey, I'm on the BDR, oh yeah, I am too. And it's amazing how many people I've met that way. And you sit there and talk to them for quite a while because they are enjoying what, um, what the passion and, and the hard work that we've put together. It's very rewarding to me, and I know it's rewarding to the other guys to know that uh, it's, it has grown and the people are so passionate about going and doing a BDR. When BDR started and I started working with BDR and we started kind of evolving the concept of what BDR it is, I was with Butler Matt, so we made the, the 
physical old school paper maps that we're still gonna make. Now with Rever, you know, we're just doing the same thing digitally. So getting people out on a bike, having them track their rides, having them have their phone as a navigation device, using our app to inspire people to go ride, show people where to go, share them with friends. And when you come on BDR, it's it's for a lot of people, this is their their trip for the year or a lifetime really. People coming from Europe, this is the trip of a lifetime and it should be because they're fantastic. So being able to share that with people, have the track, have the photos and have a memory of it, share it around to Facebook, keep it all in one spot. That's that's what we're doing with the Rever. It's really exciting. Along with the usual suspects, some new faces joined the Nevada Expedition. I am the owner of uh, Wolfman Luggage and we manufacture motorcycle luggage, we, especially for adventure bikes, dual sport bikes and uh, so on. The BDR, the Backcountry Discovery Route Group, has created the breadcrumbs and that kind of gives people the push. That's what they needed to do this and that's so cool. I'm a court administrator for the city of Mercer Island. I chose that job so I could um, have more time to pursue motorcycle events and activities. I don't have much experience riding in the uh, sand. Um, however, I had the opportunity to go to South Carolina and go through the BMW Performance Academy, and I learned a lot. It was It's a fantastic school and in the training, and the instructors were you know, just top notch. In the 90s, I helped. I would spend about 12 years on the strip building mega resorts. We did about eight different trades, so the Bellagio and Venetian and, you know, Paris and MGM, those all are projects that we've worked on. My passion has always been motorcycle riding off-road, and in retirement, I, I want to do something that I really enjoy, and since I've been riding the Southwest for over 45 years now, and I know a lot or most of the cool places, I want to share it with other people. It's really about as simple as that. My background's in journalism. I, I worked at, uh, before coming to, uh, to uh, the MOA, I worked at the News Bureau at the University of Illinois, so I have a news background. Uh, I also have a commercial photography background, so kind of combining those two elements into the magazine production is, is what's been working for me. I, I did kind of prep for the trip by watching a handful of the DVDs, and uh, so I have, that, that's, that's like, been my basis for what to expect for the most part. So. So I, I do know what we're in for and what to expect a little bit, so it's not totally, totally new. Rounding out this year's BDR team, and no stranger to riding long distances in rough conditions, is 11-time Baja 1000 champion, Johnny Campbell. Getting to explore Nevada on a, on a race-wise is a lot different than being able to go and uh, adventure through the backcountry of Nevada. You know, we'll be able to experience all these stops and places that um, that we pass by racing we don't get a chance to experience so i'm really excited to go and see some of these places um, like gold point and tonopah and you know these Beatty and these these really historic west towns that are really uh have a lot of rich history of uh, western society you know back in the 1800s and so it's going to be an exciting event it's going to be fun to get on the adventure bike the africa twin and just roll out across the country and being able to stop and enjoy what's going on eight adventure bikes will be making the journey this week and a new addition to the bdr convoy is a support vehicle jeep driven by bdr alum and seattle area businessman kevin woody having a support vehicle did two things. Uh, one is it got our film crew into places that they wouldn't normally be able to get to. Um, and second was that it again would take some of the load off of the riders um, so that I could carry ample food. Because there's, there's a couple stretches on the Nevada BDR that are uh, into the mid 200 range. So the ability to carry extra fuel for them, uh, the ability to be able to carry extra food and that became important. Over the next seven days, these riders will take their adventure bikes along 908 miles of some of Nevada's most obscure roads into the most remote corners of the state. On the way out of Henderson, the team makes their way to the Ride Now dealership on Boulder Highway to complete final bike preparations and pick up any last minute riding accessories. I had 
a, a general manager when I worked over at the Craig Road store and uh, he was big into the, the whole adventure scene and he showed me BDR one day and it was actually the, uh, the Colorado one. And uh, I was, to be honest with you, I, I was a, a skeptic of adventure riding. I kind of thought it was a goofy niche and man, I fell in love with it. It was, it was really cool watching, you know, just being able to go and see these sceneries and, and you know, being out there completely in the elements uh, with your buddies riding motorcycles. I mean, that's kind of why we got into this stuff. And uh, because of that, you know, I I followed it as as all these new routes came along, you know came on board, and you know Idaho, Utah is really cool, um, and just really excited for this Nevada one. The route to Oatman, Arizona, lies along Route 66, and this stretch actually has more twisties than any other section of the historic interstate. The crew arrives in Oatman, a charming old-time mining town complete with wild burrows roaming the dirt roads and saloons from yesteryear. At one special outpost, the walls are lined with dollar bills with handwritten notes from visitors from all corners of the globe. The BDR team drops the first breadcrumb of the Nevada route here. Pretty cool. They've got the patents listed on the listed on here. 1912, 1914, 1918. It looks like it's a 1923. Is that uh, it's a box? box. It still works too. Wow. There's gloves in there. But what's Ford's son? I mean, is that a? I think that was like a sub. They had Ford, and they just made a sub brand for the tractor. I hate to break up this love affair with the tractor, oh. but it's time to move on. Let's do it. Yeah. What a party pooper. Yeah. Let's do it. We're headed to Lafayette. Okay. Oh, we are? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And our campsite. But this is the st official starting point, right? Yeah, this is the official starting point. This is the official starting point? Yeah, of so start up your tractor and let's go. Yep. Back. Justin Bradshaw, you better get out of that bar and come well, out. Last and time see I me saw Bradshaw, he was with one of those donkeys. <laughs> oh, God, <geez. laughs> Section one of the Nevada BDR expedition takes the group from Oatman to Pahrump. This group will spend their first night camping outside Laughlin. Laughlin is a small gambling town along the Colorado River and was started in the 50s by an entrepreneur from Minnesota named Don Laughlin. The BDR crew will spend the night not far from the neon lights of Laughlin's main drag. Arriving with some daylight left, they set up camp and their tents for the first time. Some take a moment to bathe in the river while Chef Kevin starts to prep the night's dinner. Always on a BDR. You got, you know, you got your doctor thing going on too. <laughs> right, Justin, bend over. I'll be I got the honor. Justin likes it way too much. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely getting more popular. I tell you how it's changed for us. There's a Jeep over there cooking street tacos with sour cream, and the very first BDR we went on, everybody showed up with dehydrated meals in their in their pan here. So we've we've evolved. I mean, what a great. So beautiful. Fail! So beautiful. Fail! <laughs> <laughs> a hammock to the bike and the tree and uh, didn't quite have the uh, the hammock straight. Oh my god. Tried an experimental uh, hammock rigging and it failed. I brought this hammock along so I gotta figure out a way now. Relax in it, even if I, even if I crash over on someone's tent over here. Bottle, big swallow. Awesome, so much success. I think I might sleep here tonight. And you're big boned like me? Uh -huh. It tips the bike over <laughs> and pokes a hole in Bill Wiegand's tent. <laughs> a stunning beachside camp. Kevin's trailside tacos and solar light ambiance make an unforgettable evening for the crew. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha
<laughs> Personal goal for the day is to not drop the bike because if I do, I have a bet with Justin Bradshaw. If I drop the bike, I have to put his tent away. If he drops the bike, he has to put his tent away, or my tent away. So I'm going for the uh, not dropping the bike. That's my goal. My goal today is to not be the last guy out of camp because that's usually what I am. So that's pretty much my only goal. Beyond that, I just want to ride, have fun, and uh, watch Rob pick up his bike in the sand. Get it sorted? Yeah, I want to do some work around. We're the black line here. Mm -hmm. just, the Jeep can take this and then meet us over here. Mm. Yeah, it's just a straight shot. Planning the route took a year to develop. We changed the route more times than I can remember, mostly because gas stops are so far apart Nevada is so big and expansive. Uh, there's so much sand and there's so many challenging ride areas that we, it took a lot of work to find an intermediate skill level route with some advanced sections that, uh, that everybody could ride. It was an enormous project. It was bigger than I realized actually. Just after Christmas Tree Pass, with temperatures in the high 90s, the riders get their first test from the unforgiving terrain. We had a lot of sand the first day, and I did struggle, and I had some issues with my bike, and and uh, but we got that, you know, worked out. That's the other thing, you know, people tell you. Uh, I've been told, be prepared, you know, ride your bike, you know, don't pack a bunch of stuff, and and. Um, and so I got to learn that firsthand. That was fucking deep <laughs> sand <laughs> and soft. But that's the most sand I've ever done. It's pretty, pretty difficult, but I got it. I made it, I got through it. With a previous health condition hampering him, Rob Watt is having a tough morning riding through the deep sand. Like I'm walking uphill. Rob, how's your day going? I've been battling an illness for a month and a half where I can't, uh, I do anything strenuous and I can't breathe. And uh, that's what happened there, other than I probably would have gone down anyways, but uh, once I went down once, I couldn't catch my breath and then it was all over. Um, I'm still having a hard time breathing, but uh, we'll get over it and continue. Game on. Riders along this path will want to keep an eye out for Mojave green rattlesnakes, which are common amongst this area. Several rattlers were seen while riding this section during route development. So across Nevada and rural communities, they have uh, done a number of murals. And this is the first in Searchlight. It was done a number of years back, but each community that has one, it's kind of indicative of the history and the, you know, the flair of that particular community. So as we go across Nevada, we're gonna be seeing numerous murals that are significant to each town. The route today takes the riders through Prim, where riders will recognize the iconic roadside roller coaster from Buffalo Bill's Casino. Our crew grabs gas and a quick lunch on the run. section it, that was extremely rocky and my Turtex <laughs> skid plate definitely did its job. Um, I loved it. I had fun I, and I much more prefer that over the sand. So it was, it was fun. Yay! The afternoon was filled with rocky dirt riding and more charismatic saloons with funky music. Music, why not? With a fucking music, why not? 
The ride for the day ends in Pahrump, Nevada, a small town due west of Vegas known for its brothels and wineries. In an unrelated note, it's here where Johnny Campbell met up with the group. We got lucky this year. Honda came on board as a sponsor of the backcountry discovery routes, and when we were kind of figuring out what to do, we, we said, hey, let's, let's bring Johnny Campbell along on the route. I didn't expect that he'd have the time in his schedule. I didn't think that uh, it would work out, but on fairly short notice, Johnny dropped what he was doing, grabbed his Africa twin and came out here and spent a week with us riding in the backcountry, and I am so grateful. It was great meeting him. So last night we pulled into Pahrump, Nevada, and it was blowing about 40 knots of wind. There was sandstorms coming across the, uh, the gas station there. So we made the call to just check into a hotel. Uh, we had plans to camp on this lake bed, but uh, on previous trips we've set up our tents and had to sleep through you know, 40, 50 knot winds, and it's just miserable. You don't sleep a wink, so, and it really can ruin the trip. So we grabbed a hotel, we're rested, and we're gonna go out there, and hopefully uh, tonight we'll find a spot that's not windy to set up camp. At the end of day two, Rob makes the tough decision to leave the ride early and return home to tend to his health. I've been dealing with some illness for about the last uh, well, several years, but it's gotten worse in the last uh, month and a half, and it's not in the best interest of the team or myself uh, to continue, and I don't want to leave them out in the middle of the desert and uh, having to deal with an emergency, and so uh, it's, I'm going to head back to Vegas and uh, load up my stuff and go on back to Colorado. Makes me sad because this is what I do all year long uh, to prepare for these uh, trips and, and uh, help you guys out with the BDR. So um, hope you all enjoy the rest of the Nevada BDR and I know the team will. So see you guys next year. He's a good buddy, kind of a ride leader. Also he lost a bet and he's supposed to make my tent tomorrow night. So that sucks that I have to do that myself. Leaving Pahrump, the group of now just seven riders heads 151 miles northwest toward the old mining town of Gold Point. Big Dune is a section of sand dunes, as high as 400 feet tall. Just after Amargosa, that is a favorite spot for local riders. I've ridden plenty of sand on the big bike, but I don't think I've ever been on seeing proper sand dunes. I mean, it was like we were in Africa, it's super cool turn the traction control off and use all the power that those bikes have to get up on top. So Bill got his F800 stuck in the sand over there and so Johnny rode back in and rode out on Bill's bike and when he got here he got off and he said this bike is unrideable. There's so much weight on the back. Feels like there's a load of bricks on it. It was a long walk. I was a little exhausted, a little tired. I tried riding out and uh, it wasn't going very well. And just at that time, Johnny Campbell rode by and said, hey man, I need you, Johnny. Everybody here just wants to have fun and a good time. And uh, yeah, I think uh, some of the setups are a little bit awkward. Some guys are carrying a little bit too much and uh, just need to, uh, Downsize our package. <laughs> we got to figure out a way to get some of the weight off the bike to give uh, Bill Wiegand a fair shot at this thing. So we unloaded what we could and we're strapping it to the roof of the Jeep. So hopefully Bill's uh, going to have an easier time finishing the ride, which has actually been quite difficult. A lot of sand and loose rocks and things. So it's, uh, it's pretty tough and the lighter the bike is, the easier it is for the rider. Loading even more gear onto Kevin's overflowing Jeep. Stay tuned to see how that's going to work out. The most important tip I can give somebody is take this very seriously and take it as an expedition. So you really want to practice to learn to ride well in all terrains and you also really want to make your packing, make sure you bring everything you need and nothing you don't. I'm still trying to get myself wrapped around the sand and ruts. That's been my downfall so far. Uh, but uh, it's getting it's getting better. It's getting better. So hopefully by the end of the route, uh, ride I won't uh, won't go down. <laughs> Kevin Woody spared no expense in outfitting his Jeep for this journey, but with the added weight from extra gear from all the riders, 
It proved to be too much even for this heavily modified rig. Just a few miles outside of Beatty, the lug nuts on the left rear tire give out on the support jeep, causing a breakdown that leaves Kevin Woody stranded along Interstate 95. And so did your vehicle stall or was that? Wheel, oh no, you said it was the axle, the axle was broken, right? The wheel fell the off, the wheel fell off. Yeah. Oh, the wheel fell off, okay. And you're okay though, or? Yeah, we're fine. Oh, well, this is a tough one. So now we're going to have to try to figure out. I called uh, Rob, who is in Kingman, Arizona right now, who has just turned around to head back. So my guess is we're going to get these guys to the campground. I'm going to go back into Las Vegas and try to find a rental truck uh, or something like that so that we can get back to here, pick up all the food and the gear that's on the vehicle and so we have stuff to eat and make our way so looks like it's going to be a long night tonight. Get to come back and uh, be all rested up for tomorrow morning. So This sucks. Shouldn't be happening. <laughs> With Kevin sorting out renting a replacement support vehicle, the BDR riders realize they will not make it to Gold Point as intended tonight and decide to camp in Beatty instead. So we're at the Happy Burrow Chili and Beer, and uh, Justin has got the special chair and the special hat. How's that feel? Were you always my balls? Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so far it's been an interesting day. Sand dunes. We're rad. Got some good filming in, and then uh, and we had a little accident on the rig. Kevin lost a wheel. The wheels are coming off this trip so soon. The wheels have come off the of the Nevada backcountry discovery pretty route. Typical. I'm pretty just gonna typical. say, as a as a standard rule, when one of your wheels passes you on the freeway, not good. Not good. Not good at all. Not good. Also, as a general rule put this on you feel like a real idiot <laughs> <laughs> the small bar owners the little saloon owners in the in these towns have also turned out to be really really friendly really hospitable and they all have really I think, interesting stories to tell this is the inside of the happy bro chili and beer as you can see on the wall those are just about 1 18th of our trophies and awards that we won um, cooking chili over here is Patty. She's the owner of Mel's Diners down at uh, one of the best places to get breakfast in town. Hi. This gentleman right here is Mr. Davis. He is a local as well as um, one of the Beatty Cowboys. And he goes out and does uh, volunteer work with the VFW as well as goes around and does shows with the Beatty Cowboys, Floozies, and Petticoats. This is Roxanne, a good family friend of ours who's up visiting, who actually got voted to help work today because we needed it. My pleasure. This here was my grandmother's very first a, um, trophy. She was the AMA winner back in June of 1937. Oh, yeah, the very just first. Like I have to like this. I have to put it on. Female motorcycle races, um, racers. We contacted uh, Jeff Anderson, who is our go to emergency guy. And what we've done is he's offered to uh, loan us this Dodge 4x4 uh, quad cab. And so he made his way out. Uh, he's a a uh, Green Bay Packer fan and actually left uh, a game uh, watching it on television there at home and drove this uh, vehicle out to us. We got to the, he got to us at the same time the tow truck showed up. We transferred all of the gear and at that time uh, Paul and Curtis and Tracy showed up, told us uh, where the campsite was next to a pond and in a just under three hours, we were capable, or we were ready um, to be on the move again. So now we're just moving on, getting close to Beatty. 
and adventure is, you know, it's not always the easiest path. It's, you know, there's obstacles in between those, from point A to point B, and, and a lot of times you have to overcome those, whether it's um, a mechanical, or it's a, a sand dune, or it's, it's a, a rock riverbed, where it's kind of technical and tricky. When you get into those challenges, then you get to see, really see the personality of a person, how they react to a struggle. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Maybe you are a real man's man. At their impromptu campsite that night, eccentric friends from lunch come to visit the riders and give them a truly Nevada experience. Here comes cowboy. trouble. My cowboy and a hooker last night. <laughs> pew, 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 pew. Welcome to the United States. This is Beatty, Nevada. <laughs> I don't, we I don't Beatty. care where you're from. <laughs> Welcome here. That's a true story. They came blazing in on a sand rail last night about uh, at about dusk and crashed our party. Super nice, but for real, a cowboy and a hooker. He had his sheriff badge on, he had his gun. It was uh, it was unique. That's the first for me, absolutely. Oh, talk about a party! I met two ladies out of Vegas. I'm going, holy crap, man! We danced and we had we had a great time. Nobody got out of hand, but it was super. What else can you do? Oh yeah. There you go. Hi guys. Crazy. That was awesome. That was really something. The town is so small that the town drunk and the town sheriff are the same person. <laughs> That's how small Beatty is. Yeah. Ryolite, like other checkpoints, have plenty of interesting nooks for riders to explore relics from the Nevada past. A lot of places to go here and there's a lot of really cool old history we saw a lot of that today really cool old ghost towns mining towns and it feels like uh, not a lot has changed out here in a hundred years 150 years since a lot of these towns started growing um, you know a lot of people know Nevada for Vegas and really once you get right outside of Vegas it's a whole new world out here The day's riding takes the group through an epic dry lake bed. We got the opportunity to ride on that dry lake bed and that was, the traction was really um, fantastic, it was really pretty and um, I really enjoyed that, that was really fun. The route passes through Gold Point, a well-preserved ghost town with an amazing collection of mining artifacts. It's here where during a pool match, Paul is reminded that when it comes to competition, Johnny Campbell usually wins. Really good. I did better than I thought. Yeah. We saw him, we were on yeah. the dry lake just 
just didn't want to kill air, so we saw the uh -huh. <laughs> So, and then we also have hidden hidden checkpoints for them too, so they can actually go and find a hidden point, like a black marker, and they go out there. And At first, I thought you said you were chasing a 76 year old woman, and I'm glad you didn't mean that. Now give me give me another week. <laughs> How long you been out here, living out? Ah, uh, since the 70s. Since the 70s. But not exclusively until uh, the last 12 years, maybe. Just a gallon should be enough, and then Johnny will grab a gallon, and we'll be good. We're gonna send a lot more bikes this way. Well, with our project. I hope you. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, every bit of what you're doing today. Thank you, sir. That's what it's there for. Appreciate it. Section three, the shortest section of the trek, stretches 91 miles from Gold Point to Tonopah. Further north in Goldfield lies a maze of mines and Nevada history. The international car forest of the last church is filled with uniquely painted cars sprouting from the ground like plants. Travel Nevada's got a saying, it's called, don't fence me in. And when you ride a motorcycle across the state off-road, you really get an understanding for why they have that slogan. And we've even got these little Nevada-shaped stickers that say, don't fence me in on the bike. So it's a really cool, I think, way to just describe the overall experience of, this, of riding motorcycles across the state of Nevada. Our right to ride is getting threatened in a whole lot of places. So for a government agency to step up and invite motorcycle riders in should be reason enough to go uh, and support that state, because they want you here. Yeah, Nevada is about independent people, about uh, freedom, about the cowboy, uh, the maverick spirit that Nevadans have. Uh, to a motorcycle rider like me, uh, it means access because 86% of the uh, property, the land in the state of Nevada is public. So we have one of the largest public lands in the nation actually. and. Uh, it's important that we have access to be able to enjoy that. Camp for the night will be in Tonopah as the riders have made up lost ground from the day before to set themselves back on schedule. Worth checking out before you leave are the Tonopah Brewing Company and Haunted Mizpah Hotel. This week we've been in the Nevada desert. It's uh, been, been a little bit warm down in the south and we've been slowly making our way uh, to the north which is kind of getting colder. The terrain in Nevada, is, uh, it varies. You know, when you're in the south, you have a lot of real open vistas, open desert, uh, some silt, rocks, um, some hard packed rows, a little gravelly. And when you start getting north in Nevada, then it uh, gets a little more uh, shrub bush, some scrub, uh, some cedar, and uh, the, the trails kind of narrow up a little bit. Um, the roads get a little smoother and uh, so for now, it's been, uh, it's been really good. The Africa Twin is the perfect unit for this style of riding. You know, we're, with Honda's long history in desert racing and making bikes that uh, fit a specific need, the Africa Twin is just that for adventure riding. You know, it has a great power plant and the, that parallel twin is just, has just such good power and uh, it has a really good Great exhaust note, actually. It's uh, kind of throaty when you get on the throttle and you want to light it up and get the thing a little sideways. Super fun power. The balance in the chassis and mixed with the suspension package handles just about anything you throw at it out here. The riders continue to rough it while enjoying a steak dinner and spinning tails around the campfire. All drunk up one night, we decided we were gonna have couch races down Craig's Hill. Yeah. At the water tower hill. So we got a couch and put skis underneath it and stuff. And then in some of our uh, testing, we were dragging it behind my my roommate's Nissan four wheel drive truck around the trailer park we lived in. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and we made it about three quarters of a lap around the ghetto. That was the name of the trailer park. That's what the locals called it. We made about three quarters of the way, and it started drifting wide, and it rear ended a car. <laughs> <laughs> my roommate's like dove off the couch. 
and it went about halfway under this car. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we all like just ran, ran under right. the snow. And uh, so some poor trailer park dweller woke up in the morning and went out to get in their car. And there was a couch, a couch jammed, jammed, under under it, jammed under the back end of it with skis on it. <laughs> and a bunch of like Sorel footprints going back to my trailer. Oh. <laughs> you didn't cover your tracks? Uh, no. Uh, so, funny. so we never got to the couch races. <laughs> Not a good thing. Section 4 covers 177 miles from Tonopah to the small town of Austin. The route starts off northeast toward a local fishing pond before turning southeast to an entry point to the Tonopah test range. The crew grabs a quick lunch in yet another ghost town, Belmont. What a beautiful area. It reminds me a lot of riding in uh, western Colorado and uh, just one of my favorite kind of environments to ride in. So cool, so wide open, and uh, just so peaceful. It's a ways we'll north take, of Austin. We'll, yeah. or a ways from Austin, northeast. This Austin. is this is dirt highway. All of this is dirt highway. Are we taking that or? Yeah. We are. Yeah. This year, Backcountry Discovery Routes has created an initiative called Ride Right, and the reason we've done this is to encourage the community to stay on the right-hand side of any road that they're on, no matter how big or small it is. If it's two tracks, stay in the right track unless you can really see ahead and, it, and the coast is clear because we've had reports of uh, some head-on collisions, motorcycles hitting other motorcycles, motorcycles hitting cars, cars hitting motorcycles. And really, if people just stay on the right-hand side, it will alleviate the problem. Uh, we've been in the middle of nowhere in Idaho, seven o'clock at night, raining, there's no way you would expect someone out there, and sure enough, two motorcycles riding side by side came around a corner, hit one of the guys on our trip, and, the, and one of the guys got really injured. So we've got this slogan, Ride Right. We've got stickers. It's a campaign we're going to be uh, supporting and trying to get the word out to encourage people to stay on the right-hand side. That's the safe way to ride and to ensure that you get a really good experience riding in the backcountry. Before Austin, Kevin and the support crew split off from the group as the path was not suitable for their pickup truck. The team reconvenes in Austin for dinner. After riding through water, several riders are cold and wet, and rather than camping, the team looks for a hotel for the night. I know there was talk of a hotel, but the three that we saw, there were none available. All, all booked? All booked. But with no vacancy at the area's few small motels, the crew is in a bind before they meet local cattle rancher Dan Young. And people like you is what makes Nevada special. Yep. Well, because I grew up in Las Vegas, yeah. and I've been in Nevada basically all my life. And what you just offered is awesome. Yeah. Really amazing. Well, I it is. I just slept on top of the mountain deer hunting this week, <laughs> last week, and I I don't I feel real sorry for anybody who's going <laughs> to try and do that. <laughs> People rob themselves of this very experience. You know, if I would have sat down and we would have just kind of done our thing and I would have stared at my phone and we would have ate our dinner and left, you know, we wouldn't have had the opportunity that we that we have here. So this has been a pretty wild well, trip so far. Yeah, you look at it as like yeah, it's been a wild well, trip. You know, I mean, just look at right here, park in a cafe, yeah. and then we, we make new friends. Yeah. It just makes it work. Well. Yeah. We were all just kind of going, wow. This is incredible. I, I can't believe that this just happened, you know. And that's what you get when you, you know, you go on a BDR trip. And, you know, you, that's, what, that's what you want to get out of a trip like this is you want to break away from the normal everyday grind of your going to your cubicle, being on your phone, and you want to get out and meet people and in the middle of nowhere and see what the rest of the world's like. 20 degrees. And I just went next door to the cafe here to use the restroom and I accidentally found a saloon and the guy had me get my own beer and told me just put it on the tab over here. <laughs> and he said, welcome to Nevada. <laughs> it will be a 30 minute ride through the dark to get to Dan Young's home. I think in the daylight this is going to be a pretty impressive view. You can see there's mountains up here and then valley down below. 
This is a little bridge that goes to the little guest cabin. So that's where the some of the guys are gonna stay. Bring your bed and your and your pajamas. There's there's a little cart full of wood right here on the porch, so whatever wood you need, I think there's matches by that cardboard yeah. box if you okay. want to start yeah. that up or whatever you want to do. And uh, yeah. I'm third generation in the ag industry in central Nevada. My family's been in the Austin, Nevada area in central Nevada for uh, almost 70 years. Since the late 40s, uh, we've been out here scratching a living out of the dirt. Uh, we run cattle and, and farm hay uh, in central Nevada, and uh, we've been doing that as long as I can remember. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit about our area and about Austin. Uh, it's a it's a small little ghost town. It's been this way as long as I can remember. Um, we we've basically subsisted as a community on ag uh, and the agriculture industry uh, for years and years when the mining kind of petered out. Not a lot of people come this way, uh, being where we are and as far away from everything as we are. And so we struck up a little conversation and uh, things came about where we found out that you guys were going to be sleeping on a hard rock and on the mountain and in the cold and we knew that we had plenty of room here to accommodate you and and uh, we were just thrilled that you guys were willing to come out you kidding <coughs> an open queen size bed huh? <laughs> twist my arm Five. did you just take a shower hot shower get out of here soap water hot wow i think up here we were at 22 degrees this morning when we woke up uh, just above Tonopah. We're up about Austin right now, and it's so doggone cold, but we found some wonderful people that took us in and uh, protecting us from the elements at this point. We're worse at communicating one-on-one -on -one with people than we've ever been. And, and so I think a lot of people in today's world, uh, because things can tend to be so busy and in your face, that uh, even if we don't really sense it, I think we, we all deep down seek out opportunities where we can unplug and unwind and maybe get off of the the hubble and commotion of daily life. So when we talked to Dan and Katie, the ones that are hosting us tonight, they talked about their small town has lost so much industry that they are barely going to be able to keep the schools open and in fact they don't have any high school students this year because the just population has shrunk so much. So these towns really need uh, the infusion of capital to get them going, to get to draw people to maintain uh, the town to be sustainable and to give us the gas and the food and the restaurants that we need that are our, our jump off points to access these great places in the back country. The young family, incredible. Yeah, got out of the cold last night. Had some really incredible people in Austin at dinner and they invited us into their home and we took them up on it and it's a really unique experience. I think. Super special. This is little Tice. He's just checking out all the action this morning. He says, I can't wait till I'm old enough to go on an adventure. Dan and Katie, we wanted to formally thank you for your hospitality. Oh, we're, our thank pleasure. You so our much pleasure. for having us. We're this was so a highlight of our trip. Oh, thanks for coming. This pleasure. is a uh, a little brochure on the BDR tells you what our organization is about, and uh, the guys stuck a little thank you in there for you as well. Oh, hey, so thank you. Seriously, no, nope. ain't no serious about it. Yeah. You're a good guy. Thanks. <laughs> well, we consider all of you guys good friends, and and uh, once a friend, always a friend. We're we ain't going anywhere. If anyone's ever passing this way again, you know where to stop in. From here, we're headed north to Elko. This is our big day, about 220 miles, and we're gonna need every drop of gas we can think of. So, it's gonna be a great day. Let's have a look at this. This is uh, from 1904, if you can read it on camera, I don't know. It says G. K. Hill, August 25th, 1904. That was etched. Who he was was an individual that lived here in the canyon where they had water year round coming through the stream and he grew produce. He was a, a gardener, I guess, if you will. And he grew produce for the miners, the gold miners and silver miners in Austin. And so he would grow vegetables and produce and he had an apple orchard and a few things here. 
and uh, and then he would fill up his buckboard or his wagon and take it into Austin to the miners and sell it. But that's that's been there since 1904. We thought maybe that would be interesting to you to get footage of that. So pleasure having you guys here. The riders leave Dan Young's ranch house refreshed and grateful for the generous hospitality. Today's route, Section 5, is the longest riding portion. The group will cover 220 miles today on their way from Austin to Elko. From Austin, the route follows the Pony Express Trail to the north to Grass Valley Road. This stretch provides more examples of the desolation and huge expanses that make up the Nevada landscape. An alternate advanced route is available here that traverses Telegraph Peak. Getting into Elko, the route presents some of the most amazing riding found in Nevada. The dips, dives, twists, turns, and elevation changes are an adventure rider's dream. I, I ran sweep, and what I find, it was the most, one of the most fragrant days. And what I mean by that is, People are bashing sage with their panniers and their hard bags and their, so their soft luggage. And just the sage blossoms. And I'm like, I'd get these just massive, just pockets of fresh sage. It was just an amazing day. And then to stop, you, you get really kind of this myopic view of, okay, I gotta ride and you gotta concentrate, especially when it starts to flow. But then we get onto some of these high speed gravel travel roads. You kind of stop and you get to relax a minute. You look around, you're like, this valley doesn't end. How big is this? And you just see this road go. It's good to open it up a little bit and let those bikes breathe. They, they handle so well in that stuff. And uh, getting it loose a little bit, having a little fun, stretching the legs, good times. Miles of amazing roads lead to Immigrant Pass and the old Hamilton stagecoach route into the backside of Elko along Highway 80. I enjoyed the further north we got because the temperatures cooled a little bit. Initially in the southern part of the state, it was really hot. Uh, but other than that, every day was, was a, a treat that uh, you didn't expect. It was like opening a new present every day. The riders have some downtime while they wait for the support truck, which had to take an alternate route. As you may know, idle hands are the devil's playground and leave it to Justin Bradshaw to be right in the middle of it. Oh, <laughs> what the f was that? That's a cow pie. That was a cow pie. While the temperatures have been steadily dropping throughout the week, as the riders continue to climb in elevation, today marks the first day they'll encounter snow. The terrain is also covered with mud and presents challenges for some of the less experienced riders. Even BDR veteran Paul Gillian leaves this section with a bike covered in mud. When you see a rut is just slow down, try and avoid it, but, but really just go through it at a low rate of speed. Uh, some of the, the times when I've really hurt myself on a motorcycle, it was, it was a rut where I got into it and I was going too fast and it just, I lost the front wheel and went down. So always respect the rut. The other saying I have is never trust desert mud. The mud that we run into in states like oh. Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, it's this caliche mud and it is just slick as grease. And you can ride through something that looks mostly dry, a little bit damp, and under the surface it's just like grease and it'll cause you to go down. Uh, on this trip I went down a couple of times and it was because I was going through that mud slowly and my, my uh, tire collected enough mud that it binded up in the front fender and stopped rotating. It just seized up and once your wheel seizes you can't keep the bike under you and you, you just go down. So. That happened to me twice because I didn't realize what happened the first time. So I got up, tried it again, and went down again. So uh, never trust desert mud. I come from Washington. We have lots of mud, and you can ride in the mud all day long. It's a little slippery and interesting, but boy, this stuff is unpredictable, and it's just, it can be really hazardous. So try and avoid it. The last riding portion, Section 6, covers just over 100 miles as the riders venture toward Jarbage, a small community in the northeast corner of the state near the Idaho border. The state name Nevada actually comes from the Spanish word for snow covered. And as the riders approach Jarbage, they'll soon experience the meaning firsthand. Riding in snow looks idyllic and charming, but at the end of a long week such as this, the riders' fantasies of gliding across the snow soon vanish. The riders and Kevin have inadvertently split up 
So while they sludge through the snow in an area without cell service, Kevin is left to wait and wonder. Here they come. Nope. Yep. Nope. We've been trying to communicate with satellite phone, but it's difficult, obviously, when they're riding to be able to respond to something. But we did get a text. We found a Wi-Fi spot. Did get a text from Curtis about 20 minutes ago, suggesting he'd be here 10 minutes ago. So we're just anticipating their arrival here at Jarbridge at the Outdoor Inn. So we're hoping. Only four miles to go, Justin. That's it. Four miles. Be there by morning. I think the best way to tackle this thing is to do it in two pieces. Come down here in the fall, spring, even the winter, knock out the southern half of the route. You can spend a week just doing the southern part of the route. Go home, go back to your job, your family, do that. And then come back in the summertime and ride the northern route because trying to do it in one stint, it's just tough. I mean, we were on the southern end, it was 103 degrees, and on the northern end, we were riding in 10 inches of snow for 10 miles, I mean, in survival mode. So I think this route doesn't lend itself well to doing it in one pass. I think a lot of people will, but I think they're going to be really hot, dangerously hot in the south, and potentially, you know, getting stuck in the snowstorms up here on the north. I just said a little prayer for us back there, so. Oh, good. It's, uh, it's treacherous for sure. <laughs> well, just try to keep forward momentum. Keep it on two wheels. Hey, Paul, thanks for the adventure. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> a little more adventure than we bargained for, but that's some, sometimes that's how it goes. Definitely. A lot more snow than I thought. Yeah, me too. I had no idea. But uh, just be glad you got good, real knobby tires. That's right. Africa twin, baby. Yep. Yeah, they're thinking we're absolutely insane. I know, what is it? Dang it, no, it's a four-wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> this one looked like it hurt. There's a bunch more bikes. Oh, I know. Oh, <laughs> there's my. There's a bunch more bikes. Yeah, I know. And they're everywhere struggling. I thought that was Kevin. I was wishing it was. So while I'm waiting, I'm going to have a Coors and sit and enjoy it. Don't fall because you won't have anyone to help pick you up. So be good. Just be steady. <laughs> Look at that view though. Curtis is, Curtis is hurting pretty good. Is he? Yeah, and uh, so is Bill. I got no service, man. Yeah. Okay, get Paul up here with his Delorme thing. Let's uh, do a text. SOS if we can and we just leave we can ditch the shit over here under these trees With tough conditions and difficult terrain the riders begin to doubt that they'll be able to get all their bikes down the mountain before sundown The team lets air out of their tires in hope of gaining some traction on this slippery surface That's what they said too. Maybe we should all air down Oh I could air down you know, the, other, the problem is it's warm right now. If it cooled off, this would firm up and be like sandpaper. But because it's 50 degrees up here, it's turning into slush. Nightfall is fast approaching, 
and the team will wander through the darkness for another six miles. You okay? So you okay? That was quite the adventure. Yes. <laughs> the best adventure is the one that that requires your very best. And the Nevada BDR turned out to be that because of all that diversity, the mud, the mud bogs you, that were unrideable, the ice, the snow, the everything. Uh, Nevada, when you come here, be prepared. Be prepared to, to ride safe, bring the right stuff, but be prepared to have the experience of a lifetime. This is absolutely insane. <sighs> It is. I was actually doing kind of okay, but it's getting icy. Right. On three, one, two, three. It has now been five hours since the whole team was together and Kevin has finished his beer and is now starting to worry about the rest of the group. Yeah, I've been texting and I'm not getting any response from anyone. All of my friends um, were on the mountain last night. Didn't know where they were. And I think uh, my favorite moment was I was talking to Rob on the phone and I'm trying to figure out how we were gonna communicate back and forth. And I saw, I think it was your bike go by. Then I saw Johnny's bike go by and then I saw Justin's bike go by. And I, I honestly think that was probably Huge sense of relief and, and felt really good. Sorry about the disconnect out there. Yeah. God, you scared the shit yeah, out of me. Uh, <laughs> Curtis wanted to do the expert only loop, but he didn't really tell you guys where to meet us. And so when we got out there, I said, hey, how are we going to find our film crew again? And he was like, so he went back to go get you guys, and then we were trying to use the DeLoreans and stuff. but. So sorry about that. We got some killer yeah, you're alive. helmet yeah. cam we were stuff. So worried. <laughs> we were so worried about you. But, uh, about you guys. Jeez. So we've been slogging it out in the snow for 10 miles. That's and weird. a couple of the bikes uh, just couldn't make it. Uh, and so we've got, there was a hunter up there cruising around in four wheel drive. So we stashed the bikes and put uh, Curtis and Bill in the truck and they're coming down. And then the rest of us rode in the snow. Uh, I guess Tracy and uh, Eric are still, still coming. They have you guys seen them lately or? Yeah. No. That was proper oh, adventure, man. huh? Thanks for the thanks for it. the kind bar at the roof oh, at the top there. That, yeah, that's no worry. Saved my ass. Oh my god. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> I didn't die. <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> I didn't die. So Tracy, what ha what happened yeah. out there today? <laughs> Just about everything you can think of. Had lots of snow, a lot of ice. Um, how many miles? I don't know. How many miles? 15 miles? 20? With deep snow. Yeah, it was it was quite the adventure. We talked to some guys up there, and they took pity on us and, and uh, brought uh, two of my teammates down in the back of a truck. I thought about doing that, but I thought, nah, I could get my bike down. So, and I did. My bike's down, and here, here we are in Jarbridge. So you're a part of the BDR ski team now. <laughs> Uh, they were really slipping and sliding and they were had their feet in the snow like pontoons, like skis. And I'm thinking, geez, their feet got to be wet and freezing out. And if they get down to Jarbridge and nothing's open, they're going to have to go on. You know, they might end up getting hypothermia. We have better make sure they're all right. We've been helped out before too in the past. So it, it's, uh, it's kind of common courtesy that you help out people that you see in distress when there's no reason that you can't help them out. It's not like we're in a hurry to go somewhere. It turns out that, that or Bill, that Bill is a budding young contractor out of Winnemucca, and he doesn't have a contractor's license yet. So he's at the beginning of his career, 
and I'm at the horizon of mine. So we're going to continue to have conversation. I'm going to help him out. I'm going to tell him what I've learned over 45 years to help get him started. Uh, and just give him some good sound advice. Uh, it's the best thing I can do, and, and it, it's amazing what happens. You know, people help one another out. He helped me out, and I'm going to help him. This is the end of the Nevada BDR. We just spent a whole week on the road, on the trail, and we had an epic finish just tonight over the pass behind us, into the snow, had a bit of a struggle, pushing people's bikes through, sliding all over the place, and this is where he ended. Awesome people here. This is actually where the Idaho BDR starts as well, so I've been here once before, and just as I remember, everybody's super, super awesome. An awesome place to end a BDR, an awesome place to start one. Here's the survival, surviving the Nevada backcountry discovery route. Made it first. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> The next morning, the riders awake from a well-deserved night's rest and pack up to head home today. I thought having the designer um, of Wolf and Bags on this route um, was fantastic. He started, it started on our day one, um, just packing the bags and, and the fit of the, the bags on my motorcycle and just helping adjust um, those bags and making sure that they were in the right position and, and tight and everything. And um, so I got to learn a lot and I, I was very, I'm very appreciative of that. All right, stickers, we completed it. Though I've earned the right to put it on the pan here. I've never experienced anything like this at all. This is fantastic. This is this is what off-road riding is all about. This is adventure riding, true adventure riding. This is awesome. A few years ago, we were lucky enough to meet Curtis Cummings. He was a Nevada guy. He just really wanted to do a, a route across the state of Nevada, and he talked us into it. And boy, every every day, every week that I've known Curtis and worked with him on this project, I'm just more and more impressed. We are grateful to Curtis for creating the Nevada route. And I have to say that it is one of my favorites. And in essence, we're very proud and happy to have successfully made it across this route. And uh, I think for the folks that did this, they really now understand what Nevada's about. After a week of riding through over 900 miles of varied terrain, the group has shared some great times and epic adventures.